early 90s, I was doing research in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And it's pretty natural when you're doing that kind of research, when, you're, when you've written about your 150,000th line of code in, in a big program, to wonder why a computer running this program or this kind of program might be having experiences. For me, when, when the question occurred, it, it became a bit obsessive because it seemed quite obvious to me that what I was doing could help to explain the behavior of a computer and by analogy or extension, the behavior of a robot or the behavior of a human being. But there seemed to be a separate question about why information processing, which drives behavior, would be accompanied by subjective experience. So I started to research that question separately to see what people had said. And it became pretty clear to me pretty quickly that consciousness was a refugee. What I mean by that is consciousness was exploited by dreamers. It was often protected by moralists. It was ignored by experimentalists. And it was not taken seriously by theorists. So as a phenomenon, it had gathered the interest of many disciplines, but it hadn't found a home in any of those disciplines. And so if there was any very central and important natural phenomena that had a claim to being an intellectual refugee, consciousness was it. I think the ordinary person on the street feels they have a soul. Right? And the idea of having a soul is very tied in with our experience right? and the fact that we're conscious. Most people who feel that they have a soul will often imagine, for instance, that they can live after death. And their life after death consists at least partly of the fact that they might experience heavenly things, right? that their consciousness might be transferred from their body. Right? Well, it seems pretty clear from everything that we know about the world that that view of the soul is wrong, that we don't have any such soul. But by the same token, it's pretty clear from what we're learning from neuroscience that what most neuroscientists would tell you the soul is, is not right either, which means as from the perspective of a man on the street wanting to understand what intuitively I might have thought of as my soul, there was no really good right, theory right, or understanding of what that might be that was available to any of us. So at that time, I was essentially a physicalist. I believe the material world is, is the world as it was. And I was, I was disturbed by the fact that the, the material world, as I felt we understood it, and as I understood physics and as I understood information science, right, did not seem to have a very comfortable place for consciousness and for experience. So I began to read around again what other people had been saying about consciousness and where the problems were in trying to understand it. And it seemed to me that there were a whole variety of issues surrounding consciousness that all pointed towards problems with causation. Um, there's central problems regarding consciousness, which is just, just arise from wanting to know what its causal role is, what it does. That those clearly involve causation. But there are also other more subtle problems, many of them attached to the fact that consciousness does seem, right, the character of our consciousness does seem to be very tightly correlated with information processing and with the functional role of certain kinds of units in our brain. And those kinds of questions, questions about what information is and what it is to have a functional role, are all questions that involve causation. So that led me to, on a further step down the road, which is to start reading about what people said about causation. You know, what is causation? Right? And how does causation underlie the fact that information can arise, or that things could be said to have functional roles. In our everyday life, you might see the sun come up in the east and go down in the west. And as the sun is going down, we see the moon coming up in the east. And then the moon goes across the, sun, across the sky and comes down in the west as the sun is coming up in the east. Well, if you're watching that and you see these correlations, right, it's very natural to think that the moon is chasing the sun around the sky. There's, there's, there's kind of a way that people normally think about things where we jump to conclusions from seeing certain kinds of things, where those conclusions often are only one among many possibilities. Right? And so you might jump to a conclusion that the moon is chasing the sun around the sky, but in fact, there are many possible explanations for that. And what the right explanation is depends on knowing quite a lot of things and being able to systemize quite a lot of things. And what science is in the business of doing is discovering and systemizing those many types of things. With respect to consciousness and information processing, we, have, we know without a shadow of a doubt that there are extraordinarily tight correlations 
right, between the presence and the structure and the character and the behavior of conscious states and the information processing that's going in our, on in our brains. But we have not yet found that very tight systematic right, explanatory link between the two. Right? And what it would be to find a place for consciousness right, would be to, to be able to systematize it in terms of all these other things that we know so that that very tight explanatory link right, comes through. I, I don't think that we're, because we're conscious beings, we're limited in understanding consciousness. What it would be to understand consciousness is to have certain kinds of general truths that systemize a lot of more specific facts. That's, that's generally what happens when we discover the true relationship between the sun and the moon and the earth, or in any scientific domain where we get true explanatory clarity. Right? We, we discover certain general truths that apply to a whole range of specific facts. And there's no reason to think that there aren't general truths that apply to the existence and the nature of consciousness and the way that it relates to the other things that we know exist in the world, and including brain states and information processing and body states and our behavior. Right? And if we can discover those general truths, we should be able to comprehend them and should be able to place them in our entire system of general truths in a way that allows us to really understand deeply right? what, why consciousness exists, what it does, why it has the character that it does. Right? And that's, that's what I've been after. And when I say I want to find a place for consciousness, that's what I mean. But I want to understand what these general truths are and how they fit in to the network of other general truths that we know that allow us to systematize a lot of the more specific things like why we laugh, why colors look the way that they do, why the mind is able to interact with the body in the way that it does, if it interacts. And where are you to, as of today? Well, I, I started looking at causation right? because it seemed to me that there was this kind of locus of problems surrounding causation if, whenever you tried to understand consciousness. And I, what happened was somewhere along the line I got, I got dragged very deeply into the problem of causation. And the problem of causation became in some sense primary. And the problem of consciousness became secondary, something that I would understand by understanding causation. The First. problem of consciousness basically took me into the problem of causation. Okay. I, was, I was really being dragged against my will into metaphysics is what happened. I started out as a computer scientist wanting to know about what seemed like a kind of ordinary natural phenomena of consciousness, and I got step by step dragged into what turned out to be metaphysics. Dragged by your curiosity or? Dragged by, not just by my curiosity, but by the rational demands of the investigation. That you, when you're trying to understand something, certain questions get raised, and those raise certain other questions, and those raise certain other questions. And you, follow your, you find yourself, like, like an author writing a book, you find yourself led right, through the plot. And I was being led to causation. And I read it like I did when I first started trying to understand consciousness. I, I started reading things that people had been writing about causation. And those were even worse. Right? Causation is, is something everybody takes for granted and nobody tries to explain. So I had to step back on causation even and ask myself, what is the problem of causation? What, what is it that I'm supposedly trying to understand? And the way that that I've come to understand it, I can, I can explain through a metaphor. Right? Imagine you had two canvases. Right? One was an or that you would paint on. Right? One is an ordinary canvas, and the other one we'll call the canvas of causation. Right? On the ordinary canvas, I can stand above it, and I can drop a, a drop of red paint on it. And the paint will hit the canvas, and it will stick. And then I can drop some green paint on it, and the green paint will hit the canvas, and it will stick. In fact, I can choose my colors at random, and I can drop them on the canvas. Every color will hit the canvas and stick. And the canvas doesn't care whether you know, the final result is beautiful or ugly or anything in between. Whatever I drop, the canvas will accept. But my canvas of causation is different. And I can stand above my canvas of causation and drop some red paint on it, and the red paint will stick. Then if I drop some green paint next to the red paint, the green paint bounces off. The canvas won't accept it. But I can drop some yellow paint next to the red paint, and the red paint sticks. And I find as I try to fill the canvas of causation with color that it becomes more and more picky, that in fact every color which sticks seems to place a constraint on what other colors can stick to the canvas and wear. And in fact, even more strangely, the end result, although I could end up with many paintings this way, the end result is always a beautiful painting. Right, somehow it's enforcing some kind of laws, and these laws are in their own sense 
aesthetic. Right? Well, the problem of causation is why we don't live in a world that is like the ordinary canvas. Right? Why don't we live in a world where events can simply happen? Right? Any event can happen anywhere. Right? Instead, we live in a world which is like the canvas of causation. And that canvas seems like magic. Right? There's something very special about that canvas. Right? There's an ingredient in that canvas which is not in the ordinary canvas. Right? And that ingredient is what we call causation. Right? That causation is a sense in which something happening places constraints on what else can happen. Causation actually in scientific theory does not usually enter in. What often, what often does enter in right, to scientific discourse are things like determination and transfer of energy so that one might have an event that occurs in a scientific theory. And given that an event has occurred, say an electron right, has popped into existence, right, that may cause a distribution of energy right, in the future that might not otherwise have occurred. Right? But causation is, for the most part, a term of ordinary language. Right? It's a term that we use in our daily lives. Our ordinary concept of causation, I would say, is the concept that one thing can produce another. There can be more than one potential cause of something, even in our ordinary concept. For instance, somebody might cause a door to open by opening it, but many different people could cause that door to open. What I actually dug dug into and that the canvas of causation is supposed to illustrate is an idea of causation that's more general and that goes a bit deeper than our ordinary concept of causation. That the ordinary concept of causation of one thing producing another is a very speci specific concept. Right? It doesn't apply necessarily to everything that we might want to call causation. And what I, what I ended up doing and what the, can the canvas of causation is supposed to illustrate, what I ended up doing is coming up with a notion of causation that was so general, it would apply not only to the ordinary concept of causation, but to possible causal situations that occur in very strange theories like quantum mechanics, and also concepts of causation that apply in worlds that don't even exist, but they get modeled on computers. Right? There are computer models called cellular automata that basically are just toy physics that computer scientists make up. And these can have all different kinds of models of the way things constrain one another. And the idea was to come up with a concept of causation which was so general, it could apply to any of these possible worlds. Right? It could apply to the strange world that we know we live in that's governed by quantum mechanics. It could apply to the more intuitive world that we used to think we live in, which was Newtonian mechanics. And it could apply to these even more exotic worlds that can be created on computers with, with toy physics called cell cellular automata. And the key idea is simply that causation is an operator on, a, on the things which are possible. And from particles, you can get molecules. And molecules, you can get cells. And from cells, you can get organs. From organs, you can get organisms. Right? And you can get various kinds of patterns of activity in those organisms. Right? But you get a theory of how each of those layers right, needs to emerge in order for causation to do the job that it does. And how each of the things that emerge has a very special kind of causal character that makes it distinct from a rock right, or a thermostat or things that we think of as big conglomerations of things but not necessarily individual in any special way. And the structure of the theory, it, I've been, it took me 10 years to work out all the details. Uh, the, I've just finished the manuscript and the book is just now going to the publisher. But the very surprising thing is that when you get the theory of consciousness, I'm, I'm sorry, the theory of causation, you get a whole bunch of conditions, right? a whole bunch of requirements on what the intrinsic character of these individuals would have to be like. And that this set of requirements actually matches the features that we know of introspectively right, from our intrinsic consciousness. And so there's a basic posit in the theory that what we, see, what we see as causation from the outside, which is things pushing one another around or things influencing one another, has of necessity an internal aspect, right, which is basically doing all that behavior, all that activity that we see from the outside that has to have the kind of intrinsic character and structural features that we know of in consciousness. There's a kind of definition in mathematics called an inductive definition. What that means is basically it's a definition where you start with something that you just assume right, has the property. 
And then using that, you define a rule so that you can build up from those things that you assume have the property, other things which have the property. An easy example is if you wanted to find the integers, the integers are the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, right? So you wanted to find all the things that have the property of being integers, right? Well, you start off and you say 0 is an integer. Right? Then you can define all the other in integers with one rule, which just says something is an integer if it's the next number, right, after something which is an integer. Right? So that rule gives you that 1 is an integer because you already know 0 is an integer and 1 is the next number. But you can apply the rule again, right? Now you know 1 is an integer, so you can apply the rule again, and you know 2 is an integer. Well, you can do the same kind of thing with being a natural individual, right? You can take, just as an assumption, as a base case, that certain kinds of things are, are natural individuals, right? For the, the, the hypothesis is that there are very basic physical properties that are natural individuals. Right? There's, there's a very specific character that this causal relation has to have. But for one thing that would be required for the causal relation to exist would be rich feedback right, between all the different members which, Living which are interacting. Does, is there anything that gives us rich feedback that is not alive? Uh, well, there, there could be information systems right, that have very rich feedback mechanisms. The challenge of the theory is to continue making these conditions specific enough so that you can actually then start getting tests. Right, for when and and in in the book there's there's some explanation of exactly you know what the structure of of these relations needs to be and there are some further conditions also, but the the basic idea is simply that you can start with some basic things that you have good reason to believe are natural individuals, can and then by giving you, when you say natural that means they exist they without have a kind of our unitary causal nature that that exists without our inter interference right or or creation right they exist without our our creation but also they interact in the world in a very unified, specifically unified way. Right? So that they interact with other things, they receive influence from other things, and they transmit influence to other things in a very particularly unified way. One of the conditions is that if you're gonna have a higher level, more complex individual right, that exists, one of the conditions is that every one of its constituents right, must be receptive in common right, to influence by other things in the world. Right, the wind is not like that. I can, I can influence one part of the wind and any other parts of the wind that receive that influence, if there are influence, receive it through a vast chain of interaction, not, in any, not through any direct interaction. When individuals enter into certain kind of intimate causal relations, right, they create higher level individuals. Higher level individuals emerge. Just like by adding to one, you can get another integer. At each stage, as a new individual emerges, there's a reason it emerges, right? There's, there's a job that the causation is doing. And the job is that the causation is shrinking the space of possibilities. Right? What we know, for instance, from fundamental physics is that, as far as we know, the, the individuals at the lowest levels are often in indeterminate states. That is, they're not necessarily here nor there. They're not necessarily looking up or looking down. It's sometimes it's indeterminate. There's just no fact of the matter as to they're potentially either one. Right? According, to, according to the theory of causation that I've been working on, the job that causation does is that it makes the world more definite. Right? It takes these many potentialities and it shrinks them. And what happens when an individual emerges at a higher level in the way that I've been talking about through this, this special kind of causal relationship is that it shrinks the possibilities that, ex that previously existed at the lower level. And then if an individual emerges at the level above that, it shrinks the possibilities for the individuals that, are, that were at that immediately lower level. And you can iterate this, right, level after level. Right? You can, causation essentially keeps applying itself. And every time it applies itself, it makes the world more determinate. Right? It gets the world closer to being in a single state, right? having an, a single actual state. And the iteration stops, causation stops. It no longer has any work to do when you reach a level of nature where you have right, a set of causal constraints now that make the world make it so that the world is in one determinate state. My theory is not a, is a, is not a physical theory. Right? It's not a theory of specific rules about how specific things behave and the specific constraints. And so it doesn't make specific predictions about this is going to be the fate of the universe. Right? What it is is a general theory. Right? It's, it's a theory about how possible physics could be. Right? So you might have Consistent with my theory, you might have a physics which looks one way, but you also might have a physics which looks another way or a physics which looks another way. 
right? It just places general constraints on what the form of a physics would look like. If you think about it in terms of particle interactions, and you may have two particles. Let's say each particle could have two possible states. Right? That means there are four possible joint states for those particles. Mm -hmm. right? Well, when they interact, right, according to the theory, if they directly interact, they place constraints on one another. Right? And that's the emergence of a higher level individual. And what these constraints do is it eliminates some of their possible joint states. So perhaps due to the interaction, instead of having four possible joint states, maybe there are only two possible joint states that they can now take on. So two possibilities have been eliminated. Right? Before the interaction, there were four joint sure. states they might have taken possible joint states they might have taken on. After the interaction, there are only two. Okay. Right? That's what I mean when I say higher level individuals eliminate possibilities. And the idea is that, okay, now you have two possible joint states that they can be in. Well, that's still not a determinate state because the question is still open, which state is it? Is it state one or is it state two? But given enough time, well, they should... Given enough time and enough causation, right, the, you can reach a set of constraints, right, a set of interactions such that there's only one possible joint state for those two particles, right, consistent with all the causation that's going on. Right? At that point, the world is determinate and causation doesn't have anything left to do. Right? And we may be at a certain point in time where the entire causal situation is constrained enough so that the world is in only one state at this point of time. But I haven't said anything about what those specific rules and specific constraints are. And I'm just saying this is the general procedure. So it's, you're describing a process. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm describing a general procedure, but I'm not describing the specific rules that tell you what outcomes you're actually going to have. So it doesn't say, you know, is the universe going to live infinitely? It doesn't say, is the future open? Is the future closed? It leaves open all those things as ways the world might be, right? That you can create models of the world. Every good scientific theory or even any good metaphysical theory, right, should be definite enough that you can say, hey, the theory tells us this is the way things should be. Things aren't that way, so the theory must be wrong. I'm not saying the world is determined. Right? Determined means that given a past state of, of the world, every future state must be a certain way. Right? Okay. I'm not saying that. Okay. What, right? is what I'm saying mean? is the world is determinate. What that means is out of the many possible ways that, you might th that we might identify that the world could have been, there's only one way that it actually is. Everything that I've just said is an abstraction, right? which is one of the reasons why it's difficult to explain. And in fact, everything about causation and everything about physics is an abstraction. Right? Physics tells us we have quantities instantiated at space-time points. Right? And I add, a, I add a little bit of structure to physics. But what I describe still just describes an abstraction, kind of an abstract structure. Well, you can imagine, what if I gave you know, God the information about you know, the abstract structure of the world? Would that be enough for him to actually create the world? Well. The answer that I and some other you know, very smart people who have preceded me believe is no. That in fact, you can't have a world which is pure abstract structure. That the world has to have a certain kind of intrinsic content, which is carrying that abstract structure. You can think of God has to have ingredients in his kitchen cabinet so that when he gets this blueprint for the world, right, he can take those ingredients down from his kitchen cabinet and he can use them to make the world right, following that blueprint. Right? So the question arises, you know, what what were the ingredients in God's kitchen cabinet that allowed him to make a world with natural individuals arising in the way that causation says that they should be arising, you know, in general, and then it's specifically the way that physics says that they're arising? Well, what comes out of the, the abstract description is a whole bunch of requirements on what God's ingredients would have to be, right? the ways that they would have to relate to one another, what they would have to be like in their intrinsic character, and so forth. And it turns out that these requirements are so tight that it seems as if nothing but experience could meet them. That is that the experiencing of things, the experiencing of basic qualities like colors and basic feelings like itches and pains, right, are the only kinds of things that can meet the very special conditions that are needed to make this abstract structure come alive. Right? Stephen Hawking you know, once said, you know, ab physics is, is a whole bunch of equations but what breathes fire into the equations. So 
what comes out of the theory of, of natural individuals and this view of causation is that pretty much the only plausible thing that could be breathing fire into the equations is experience itself. That experience isn't something which arises from physics, but rather experience is something which lives under physics and kind of props up that abstract structure and gives it life and gives it, gives it its dynamics.